Hello and welcome, one and all, wherever you may be in the world and whenever you may be in the world. My name is Dr. Carl Palmer. Um, I am the Access Education and Training Manager, speaking to you from Cape Town, South Africa, in the Access offices. And it's my absolute honour and a privilege to welcome you to this The Habitable Planet online course and welcome you to the very, very first lecture of the science in The Habitable Planet online course. We are in for a really, really exciting learning journey where we are going to discover all sorts of things about the planet that we live on. And if you look uh, here in my uh, margins, you can see that we are on Core Talk 1. This is the first of the science Core Talks of the program. It's going to be very exciting. It's going to take 10 weeks from here. In 10 weeks, we're going to learn all sorts of things, but any long journey always starts with the first step. So let us begin. Here we are looking at uh, our habitable planet from space. Some of you might notice something a bit unusual uh, about the picture of our habitable planet, and that's that you can see that it's a different way up uh, than we'd normally expect to see it. We have represented here our planet with south at the top. Uh, the reason for that, uh, that warrants some explanation up front, and the reason for that is that north, south, east and west are all quite arbitrary when you're coming from space. If you were a space alien arriving at the Earth, um, you could arrive with east at the top, with west at the top, you could have southwest at the top. There is no frame of reference uh, within space. When the first maps of the world were put together, uh, Europeans naturally put themselves at the top, and we arrive at our convention of having north facing upwards. However, we are an African centre uh, to study the climate and to study the planet, and so as an African centre, we've decided to put Africa, and particularly South Africa, at the top. And you'll see that uh, again and again throughout our branding. So it's a deliberate decision to put us on top and centre of this story of a habitable planet. And something else that's the centre of this story of a habitable planet uh, is you, you yourself. Um, I have a label for uh, you, it's hopefully roughly right, looking at the applications to this course, it's roughly right uh, for most of us. In my opening talk today, to start introducing the Habitable Planet course, I'm going to think about two really, really interesting questions that I'm sure everybody listening to this has thought about before at some time in their life. The first question I'm going to think pertains to that beautiful globe that we have on, hey, that's, uh, that side of the screen uh, up there. The question is, where did that come from? And the second question pertains to you, and is where did you come from? So these are two of life's great questions, which I am going to provide some interesting, I hope, and scientific perspective on in order to kick us off on our quest to think about the habitable planet. So I'm going to start by answering the first of those great questions. Where did you come from? Uh, in order to do that, I am going to start by thinking about you now and working back to how we got to you now. Now, I have my uh, PhD in chemistry. I'm really, really excited and interested about the discipline of chemistry. And as a chemist, I can say two things about you that appear to be completely contradictory, but are actually both absolutely true. The first thing that I can say with confidence about each and every one of you listening to the talk today is that all of you, all of you out there, are completely boring. And by that, 
I mean chemically and not in terms of your social life. I don't know about uh, what you're doing in your spare time. But what I do know as a chemist is that you are made up from carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, a bit of phosphorus um, and a bit of hydrogen. These chemicals are extremely common in the Earth's crust. They make up basically dirt. The chemicals that you are made from, from a chemistry point of view, are exceptionally boring. So, that's the bad news. But the good news is, despite being boring, the exact combination of chemicals that make you up at this moment now watching me speak is unique in the history of the universe. That group of chemicals never, ever, that specific group of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus and hydrogen, those particular atoms never came together before in the entire history of the universe and they will never come together again. That unique moment of all those atoms making up you, that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, that made up you 30 seconds ago when I first mentioned it, has gone. It was a one-off event in a massive universe that is billions of years old and will go on for billions of years. That is absolutely incredible and that event has gone forever. Why has it gone forever? Because in the time since I mentioned it, you have breathed in and taken in new atoms of oxygen and you've breathed out and released carbon dioxide. So new atoms have come in, other atoms have gone out. That one moment will never happen again. That is truly, truly a miraculous and absolutely unlikely thing to have happened, that those atoms all came together to make you. But if we investigate more into the story of how those atoms came together to make you, it gets even more and more unlikely and incredible as we go. So, we can think about how did you get to being part of this online course and to think about that and the remarkable story of you getting here. I'm going to go back to the start, well at least the start of you. And the start of you there, um, we uh, have you as a, a little uh, baby. That's obviously not you specifically, it's just to represent you in general, you get the idea. Um, and also, I'm not saying that everybody watching this was born in the year 2000. It's just an example. Or born in South Africa, for that matter. But for way of an example, uh, there were one million, approximately, babies born in South Africa in the year 2000. So there's a million of them. You are one in a million, quite ordinary at that point. But what happened after that starts to become quite incredible. The first thing to say is that you made it to five years old. We live in a continent with the highest infant mortality in the world and around 20% of babies do not make it to the age of five. So you managed that, you became a little um, uh, five-year-old and uh, you're so the chances there of getting to that point are four out of five. Okay, not that remarkable, but then what happened is you graduated, right? You got yourself an education, you got to varsity. Only 10% of the population make it to varsity. Fewer actually manage to get an undergraduate degree for those that have. And then you applied to be part of this online course and ended up sat there. The chances of getting uh, uh, your application in and accepted to these online course is very, very low right? We only have a thousand out of that initial million. So suddenly you can see that the odds of you making this journey to being part of the online course and making that combination of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen that was sat in front of your computer five minutes ago is less and less and less at every step. It becomes quite a remarkable and unlikely journey that you took to get here. That in itself to make up that combination of atoms would already be a remarkable story that is exceptionally unlikely. However, 
we can make it even more interesting and see the even more exceptional and unlikely nature of your journey if we take it back even before you. Because this little guy up here actually isn't the start of how those atoms ended up together for that once-off unique moment in the universe making you um, just five minutes ago. Because we can think a little bit back about what was the story that made you originally. Now, I'm afraid I have some bad news for those of a sensitive disposition that uh, the following story has a little bit of a trigger warning. We are going to have to think about some things about your parents that may be a little bit uncomfortable for a few of you. Because for each and every one of you to actually be here, you had a mum and a dad who did something like this, right? And it's a bit uncomfortable to think about. And the bad news is that definitely all your parents were doing that. And uh, if you've got brothers and sisters, I'm afraid it definitely happened more than once. But that makes the story of you appearing even more incredible, right? Because your mum and your dad managed to do that at least once. They didn't die when they were a kid, they grew up and they managed to persuade somebody, somehow, whatever the circumstances were, um, to go and do that thing with them to make you and maybe more times to make uh, your brothers and sisters. That's quite remarkable because all those things had to happen in order for you uh, to get here. Worse still for those who don't want to think about this, and quite frankly, who does want to think about this? Uh, the same applies to your grandparents. I've uh, left uh, the, uh, the emojis out there because it just doesn't really bear thinking about, does it? Your grandparents on both sides had to do this as well. And back and back and back throughout all of your generations as we go back and back and back, each of your ancestors was always able to persuade somebody to uh, go to bed with them or to marry them or to do something like that but in order to create you. And at each one look at these steps, these people all have to live, they have to get educated, they have to not be the village idiot, not be someone who goes and dies before they, they get married. All of them make the right choice to get there to you. This is becoming an incredibly unlikely story now because all these choices had to go right to get to you that moment in the lecture theatre just 10 minutes ago. Moreover, this couldn't have gone wrong so easily right. Uh, imagine that instead of this unbroken sequence uh, going here to make you, if your great-grandmother had decided to take a vow of celibacy and become a nun, you wouldn't be here. Right? And this goes for anything that stops any of your ancestors from reproducing. Right? If at any one of those steps there was a reason why your ancestors didn't reproduce, you wouldn't be here. That moment, those atoms coming together to watch this talk ten minutes ago would never have happened. Right? None of your ancestors ever were the stupidest in the village or the ugliest in the village which is a good example, right? Let's take an example um, of somebody who, who didn't reproduce as yet. I don't have any biological kids. And look, I'm not saying that this is the reason I don't have any biological kids. Um, but if you look like this in your early 20s, nobody's going to want to reproduce with you. So anything that takes out any of your forebears out of that cycle, out of that linear um, progression towards you of all being able to reproduce would mean that, that moment doesn't happen, right? That once-off combination of atoms, you would never be here. This is incredible. And we can go all the way back from humanity. None of your ancestors were ever that off-putting to the opposite sex. But we don't just go back through human ancestors. Right? This is a science course, and so we present the current, most well-recognised science theories in everything that we do here. 
And so it's not just your human ancestors that we need to think about, who were all somehow able and not the uh, ridiculous looking one that was unable to reproduce, but we can go back in evolutionary history. At no point in your lineage was your ancestor ever, for example, the ugliest ape-like creature. Okay? And at no point in your ancestor, if we go back and back through evolutionary time, you were never uh, the ugliest small mammal um, that couldn't reproduce. And all the way back, you were never the ugliest aquatic organism that couldn't reproduce. Right? Every link back in that family tree of life, your ancestors were always the ones that managed to reproduce, coming down and down and down from the original cells here all the way through the tree of life to humans and then to you. That story is incredibly unlikely to make that once-off combination of atoms that was listening to that talk, um, to listening to my talk, this talk, in fact, uh, 10 minutes ago. Uh, this story takes us back over a time period of four and a half billion years. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. That is a level of time that our human brain really struggles to understand. But what we do know, and what we'll come to in this course, is that around three billion years ago, um, not too long after uh, the Earth uh, was formed, geologically speaking, the first cells that gave rise to all of the life on Earth were already living and breeding and reproducing on that early planet. And so this uh, really finishes the, our first part of where did you come from. We finish by thinking about those early cells. Four or uh, three billion years ago on an Earth that's four and a half billion years old. That journey to get to that once-off combination of atoms that made you was quite, quite incredible. But it couldn't start if there wasn't an Earth for those first cells to be on originally. So for the second half of the talk, we need to think about why on Earth was four and a half billion years ago there an Earth suddenly there? Where did that Earth come from? And why was that Earth made of the right kind of things uh, for those first early cells to appear. Let's have a think and find out. So to think about where the Earth came from, we have to think even further back in time to where the universe itself came from. And to do that brings us to something that I think most of you will be familiar of, which is the current scientific theory, and uh, not the TV show. <laughs> the, the Big Bang Theory is a very popular TV show that most of you will be familiar with, but it's also the current and only accepted scientific theory on the origins of the universe. And for our talk today, I'm going to do two parts. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the theory says uh, and why that's relevant to our habitable planet. And then I'm going to tell you why people believe the theory. Because we're going to see that it sounds really quite crazy when you put the theory forward, but we're then going to see why this is the one accepted scientific theory, because it explains an incredible amount of evidence and makes predictions that have been tested and continues to make predictions that are tested and verified again and again. But firstly, what is the Big Bang Theory if it's not a TV show? Um, let's have a look. When I was a kid, I uh, was taught about this at school and taught that the Big Bang Theory tells us that the universe has a time zero. And that time zero is around 14 billion years ago. Now, firstly, when we're told that it's around 14 billion years ago, I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that we don't know uh, almost exactly when time zero is. It's just 14 billion years 
is such a big number, and to be precise, would take forever. The actual number is 13.9734. It would go on forever. So you'll hear people say about 13.9 billion years, about 14 billion years, or even about 15 billion years. This is just rounding off because the number is so big, it would make no sense to reel off all of those digits. And 15 billion in our head is probably about the same as 13.9 billion. It's a huge number, right? And one that's really tricky to get our head around. So we have a, a fixed time zero to the universe around 14 billion years ago. And at that time zero, the physics tells us that everything that is contained within the known universe was all compressed down into one infinitely small dot. We call that infinitely small dot a singularity. And as a kid, I would have kind of liked to imagine it like this, like a tiny, tiny little dot in a whole bunch of nothingness. And yet physicists tell us that that's incorrect because there was no nothingness for the dot to be in. The dot contained everything that was. Many of you will ask the question, what happened before uh, the singularity 13.9? billion years ago? Great question, you. Difficult answer. Um, I mean, firstly, we don't have any evidence for that. Science looked at uh, a body of knowledge of things that we have evidence for. But the second thing to say is that the minute physicists tell us that time was also created in the Big Bang. So 13.9 billion years ago, time was created. And asking before what happened before time was created is a meaningless question because before is a measure of time. It plays with your mind. We don't need to worry about it too much in the context of this course. We're more interested in what happened after the Big Bang. And so after the Big Bang, um, we have what's happened represented on this diagram. Now, there's lots of text on this diagram. I don't need you to be reading that. I'm going to guide you through the important things that we want to see from it. And by the way, I downloaded this from the internet. You can do it too. It's uh, very, very easy to go find online. So uh, what does it show? This is at our time zero, which is about 14 billion years ago. This is now, as you can see, it says 15 here. These are all just approximate the present day. Uh, at this side of the diagram, <coughs> we have the singularity at time zero. <coughs> Excuse me. And the universe is very, very small. And because everything is compressed, very, very hot. You can see after just a fraction of a second into the life of the universe, um, we have a temperature of 10 to the 27 centigrade. It is very, very small and very, very hot. And as we move from time zero to today, the universe gets expands, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and colder. And by today, we have something that is massive and freezing on average, minus 270 degrees. Okay, so time zero, compressed and hot, by now spread out and cold. So we can now ask the question, what does this tell us about the habitability of planet Earth? And so the first thing to note is over on this side, it's very, very compressed and very, very hot. Physics doesn't work like we need it for a habitable planet. The first really important thing to note is that we know that after just a fraction of a second, we get gravity forming. And now gravity, right, is really useful for habitability because if we didn't have gravity, we'd all float off the planet. So very, very important development. Next, in this very, very hot and compressed early universe, there's no matter forming. Uh, protons, electrons and neutrons don't get together to form atoms. The first atoms that are formed are only formed 300,000 years into the history of the universe. <clears throat> That's incredible. 300,000 years with no atoms. But the only atoms that are formed are small ones, helium and hydrogen. So one proton, one electron start to get together. And two protons um, and two electrons start to get together to form these tiny atoms. But you'll remember, when we were thinking about the journey of you to the lecture theatre, you're made of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus. Where did those things come from to make you?
To make those things, we need something like a giant nuclear reactor that will force helium and hydrogens together, right? Helium and hydrogen nucleuses, they don't want to go together. They're positively charged. What could do that to make the heavier elements down the periodic table? Those things are called stars. And stars didn't form until nearly a billion years into the history of the universe, right? And stars take hydrogen and helium and small atoms and they force them together, releases lots of energy, and that makes carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. When they say that you are made of stars, there's a reason for that. Those atoms that made up you, that once-off unique combination, they were all made in the centre of a star, right? So, we have these important things, gravity, hydrogen, helium, and stars. And to recap, the universe is 15 billion years old. The Earth is just the end of that, the last third, four and a half billion years old. We have gravity, we have matter, we have heavy elements made in stars. Now, that all sounds like a fabulous story um, that I have told you. Why on Earth should we believe something like this? It sounds really quite crazy. And for a long time, people did think it was quite crazy. The term, the Big Bang, was actually used uh, to ridicule the idea. In order to understand why the Big Bang went from something that was uh, ridiculed by many scientists to the one and only leading theory on the origins of the universe, we need to revise a little bit of high school physics. The first thing to revise is something called the Doppler effect. Now, many of you may remember the Doppler effect from high school. Some of you may remember the Doppler effect from Sheldon's t-shirt within the show, The Big Bang Theory. Whichever way you remember it from, let's have just a quick revision. It involves the way that we experience a wave differently, whether we're, depending on whether we are moving towards or away from the wave. So you see here a wave depicted on the screen. Uh, and if I hover my cursor around here, we can see a feature of a wave, which is called the frequency. This is a very common feature of waves. The frequency just tells you how frequently one of these peaks hits my cursor. And you can see that if my cursor is roughly in the same place, we have one peak, we have two peak, we have three peak. The peaks are hitting my cursor about once every second. So we'd call that a frequency of one per second. Now look what happens if my cursor moves relative to the wave. Um, now, instead of staying relatively still, we move this way. One peak, two peak, three peak, four peak, five peak. My cursor interacts with the peaks more often, more quickly. That means the frequency is higher. It has moved to a higher frequency. And conversely, if my cursor moves away from the peaks, then the peaks reach it less quickly, the wave becomes at a lower frequency. We all are familiar with this effect. When a car approaches us, we hear that distinctive meow. When the car is moving towards us, the waves get bunched up and we get a higher frequency. And in sound, a high frequency is the ah sound. Uh, as the car moves away, meow, we get the lower frequency, the ah sound. So that car noise would be absolutely the same if we were sat in the car, but if we're moving relative to that car, we experience it differently. Now, we know that sound travels as a wave, but something else that famously travels as a wave is light. I hope we all remember from school, light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, travels uh, as a wave, and we'll come to more about what light is in our lecture on light and air. I think that's next week. Um, suffice to say for now that um, what we need to remember about light is that the long wavelengths, the equivalent of the low sound, is the red side and the high wavelengths is the blue sound, the equivalent of the ah um, side. So um, long wavelengths, short wavelengths, uh, low frequency, high frequency. Red is low frequency, um, Blue is high frequency when it comes to light. So with this knowledge, we can start to interpret and understand some of the first observations that led us towards the Big Bang Theory. 
And this is simply to note that when astronomers started studying distant stars, they would point their telescopes to them, and they would note that, that all distant stars have something in common. All of them are more red than they should be. And the colour of a star is proportional to its size. It should be clearly uh, distinguishable and predictable. And yet, every star that they point their telescope at is more red than it should be. Now, I hope that from seeing the Doppler effect now, um, you can all interpret that, that we know that an object moving away from us appears more red. It's referred to as a red shift. I have even dressed accordingly um, uh, in, in keeping with the topic today. So the fact that all objects in the sky appear too red means that they are all moving away from each other. And so it's not a big leap if we apply Newton's laws that all objects keep on moving in the same direction, in the same trajectory, unless an external force operates on them. Well, there are no external forces in space. So if everything is moving away from each other now, and we were rewind time, everything was back in the same place at one point. And then all we have to do is look at how fast the objects are moving away and predict when they were all together is quite a simple calculation to come to that start of the universe. Now, obviously, this was a scientific theory that needs testing, right? We need some evidence before we believe in science and before we document this as a well uh, rigorous and robust theory, more evidence is needed. Now, there is lots of evidence now to show that this definitely, definitely was the start of the universe and that the Big Bang genuinely happened. I don't have time to go through all of it. I'm aware I've already run over because I talk too much. And the first thing that you need to understand, to think about, um, in order to understand the evidence for the Big Bang, is to know that this theory was first proposed in the 1950s by theoretical physicists. And theoretical physicists don't have a lot of money. Now they said, look, uh, if this, we're proposing that this big explosion happened 13 billion years ago. And they said, if that happened, we would see an afterglow of that explosion today. Here in South Africa, we like to bry. Uh, when you have a bry, you have hot cold the night before. The next morning, the coals glow a dull red colour. And so what the physicists were saying was that if there had been this big explosion, which was the Big Bang, it was intensely hot, by today, we would see an afterglow of that explosion at a very specific frequency. It was a microwave frequency. And they said, because everything in the universe was involved in that Big Bang, you would see this afterglow everywhere. It would be throughout the entire universe. And they said, you know, there was, that would be a huge, there would be no way that you would see that everywhere in the universe if it wasn't specifically from this event that started the universe. So finding that microwave background radiation, finding the fact that everywhere there was microwave radiation in the universe would definitively prove that the Big Bang happened. But they didn't have money. They didn't have a telescope. You know who does have money in the 1950s? It's TV people. And these are two of them. Their names are Penzias and Wilson. They are very, very famous these days for what I am about to tell you. They were working in TV and radio uh, in the 1960s, and they thought that they could use microwaves to send and receive TV and radio signals across the Atlantic uh, so that you could get American TV in Europe and um, probably vice versa. They had money, right? They had the bucks, and they built this receiver to receive the microwave signals. But they had a problem. Wherever they pointed their receiver in the sky, they got this interference, uh, this microwave radiation that was coming from absolutely everywhere. Now, these guys knew nothing about the Big Bang, um, but I'm hoping you can see the fact that the, wherever they pointed this telescope gave this microwave radiation has actually proved the Big Bang theory. Right? Because that was the one specific prediction that it made, that this microwave radiation would be there everywhere, and these guys, they see it everywhere. But they knew nothing about it. The story goes 
that they wrote up about how their telescope wasn't working and was picking up this microwave radiation from all over the sky, wherever they pointed it, in a magazine about TV and radio. And one of the physicists who was working on the Big Bang uh, read this uh, magazine in the doctor's surgery, realised that these guys had proved the Big Bang. The story also goes that they won the Nobel Prize for, dis for proving that the Big Bang happened, but that they only realised how they had done it and the real way that their discovery clearly demonstrates the Big Bang when they read about their Nobel Prize story in the newspapers the next day. That doesn't sound likely to me, but it's a good story, so I'm going to tell you it anyway. But what is true for sure is that these guys definitively proved that the Big Bang actually happened. There's a bunch more evidence about this microwave background radiation. This shows how it varies across the sky. And the main headline that I want you to take is that for the next 70 years, no one bit of evidence has not been in line with this theory. Every test of the Big Bang theory produces uh, success. It is always past any test. It explains the presence of the universe clearly, and it explains why the universe is like it is. There is no other theory going. So Big Bang, gravity, matter and stars brings us to a universe today that is massive. It is full of space. This is the Milky Way. I hope some of you will recognise it. It is basically our local galaxy. It's just a small part of the universe, as, as we shall see, and yet it has 200 billion stars in. Scientists estimate 100 billion planets. Space is full of space, right? That is quite incredible. But look, our Milky Way, I've written these numbers out just so you can get a feel for it. 200 billion stars in our Milky Way. All of those planets that we suspect are around those stars. The number of stars in the universe is this. This is a mad number. Try and get your head around that. You will fail. These are the ones that we've seen, right? That's not just um, the, uh, the number. This is the observable ones. There could be more. That means our Milky Way makes up a tiny fraction of the universe. I just want to give you an indication of just how big this place is. But then I want to narrow down. I want to narrow down and think about our solar system. Our solar system, along with the Earth, formed four and a half billion years ago from the debris of an exploded star. We are familiar with the eight or nine planets in our solar system. There are currently only eight recognised planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Pluto is sadly no longer with us as a planet. Uh, it is not big enough, has not cut out an orbit enough, and there's many other objects that are labelled here around the same size as Pluto. So we're down to our eight planets. When I was at school, those eight planets were the only planets known in the universe. Today, we know nearly 10,000. The other planets are referred to as exoplanets. This is just a cartoon. This is drawing, as you can see, it says 789. It was 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, we've discovered many, many more. There are now 10,000. But this shows you, here's our solar system. This shows you all of our exoplanets, planets outside of the solar system that have been discovered. As the cartoon notes, this is indeed an exciting time. So we now know 10,000 planets throughout the universe. How many of those do we know are habitable? Well, that's an exciting question. Just one. Out of those 10,000 known planets in the universe, only one of them is known to be habitable. This one. Now, this is a really interesting observation. We have learnt about all of these different planets outside our solar system, 10,000 of them, and yet only one planet is habitable. Our one or is known to be habitable, our one. Why? What is so special about this planet up here that we're looking at that makes it the only known habitable planet? That is the question that we are going to delve into in the next 10 weeks. 
We are going to take a journey to slowly break this problem down and explore why is it that this beautiful planet that you are looking at, that you are living on, that you are breathing the air of, is the only known habitable planet. I'm looking forward to the journey and I'm looking forward to engaging with you all as we go through it. And that's it from me today. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you have learned something and I hope you're excited about our next talk, which will be the first to try and figure out this problem. Try and understand why Earth is the only habitable planet. And that talk is called Not Too Hot, Not Too Cold. I hope you enjoy it and bye for now.